The, the system is also set up for you to be able to make key data important and visible to the user. So for example, if you would like the gestational age of the woman to be present, that can be in a top patient bar, that can be on the right side in a widget. Um, you can have key conditions, for example, their HIV status, so that it doesn't need to be a part of just the data elements in the entry form, but you're actually highlighting and raising the visibility for that data. Um, relationships between tracked entities uh, so that you can know, for example, the mother of these two children, you could follow the thread from the mother to the children's records. Uh, we'll be building out much more in terms of analytics with relationships in the future, but the links between them already exist, which can be very useful, for example, for the healthcare provider to be able to pull up a family and go through their records when they're doing a village visit. Uh, notifications, uh, a very powerful tool. You can set rules that will trigger the notifications based on some conditions that you've determined. Those notifications can go to the tracked entity themselves, to their phone number as an SMS. It can go inside the system to other users. You could be alerting, for example, the, the birth registrar that a birth has taken place and give them the link to the individual's data about their name, their mother's name, their, their birth date, et cetera. There are many other user tools that we have, which again are not on the analytics side. They're much more about facilitating work processes and allowing for the users to, to, to replace many of the tools that they've been using on paper, um, giving them access to referring, scheduling, taking notes, um, assigning events to other users, for example. And of course, we do a lot with security and privacy and have a focus on analytics. So within kind of this set of functionality, there are many, many different ways to use it. But hopefully what you're seeing is that there is a wide array of possibilities and ways that, again, Tracker has been designed generically to be customizable to fit your use cases and the way that you want to use it. No system has to use every one of these different functionalities. Uh, but you may want to consider adding some functionality to try to make the, the tracker implementation that you have better suit the users or better suit your data needs or be easier to use in general. So there are many different ways that you can customize the system to fit your needs. So just giving you a quick look at some of the screenshots here, showing you over on the right that all all of this is present in Android as well. You can have a single tracker implementation that's running both in the browser and on Android, depending on who your user is, where they have access to hardware or network. Um, they, you can set up things like the program notification that you see where it's just a library of possible notifications that go out to the right people, depending on the conditions that you set, et cetera. And again, just giving you a quick look at how all of that data that's coming through in individual records can be aggregated upwards. It can be used in maps. It can be used in various different types of charts. What I'm showing you here are some of the examples for the standard COVID vaccine registry that have been set up. But all of the tools that you may be familiar with in the DHS2 analytics suite uh, through the data visualization or other uh, data apps are available to be used with Tracker as well. And in fact, the data can live side by side. You can have a version of the data that is represented via Tracker and that by a HMIS or aggregate data living in the same dashboard. Another important point to make is that Tracker is both a front end and a back end. And again, this isn't a, a developer's academy. We don't need to spend a lot of time thinking about what that means for front end and back end. But the idea is that you don't just have to use the Tracker app. There are many different ways that we have tried to enable Tracker to be useful for you if you have an existing uh, individual data system, if you have an EMR, if you're using something like ODK or Comcare. All of that can be fed into Tracker backend for taking advantage of the analytics and the visualization or for combining that data and, and sharing it with the aggregate side. Um, you can also use the tools that we have available to build your own apps that are custom and serving a specific purpose that you have. So I'm, I'm showing a couple of examples here that we may hear a bit more about in just a moment. On the right, we have uh, Lau, who's created an ICD-11 app uh, using the tracker uh, data model. On the left, we have Rwanda, which has created a COVID vaccination portal where they're able to generate the unique ID from the individual and use that to lead the individual to a COVID vaccine certificate with a QR code. So again, don't feel like if you don't see what is a, 
in the tracker app, if the tracker app is either too much, it has too much functionality for your use case, or it's not specifically meeting the needs of your use case, that doesn't mean you can't use tracker. Tracker can be integrated with your other system. You can build your own simple app on top of it that removes functionality or adds some key functionality. So there are many different ways that your system can, can make use of tracker. I wanted to speak just for a moment about why we think Tracker is valuable and why the university has spent the time and effort on building out this suite of capabilities. I'm just referencing here the first guidelines that WHO put out about digital interventions for health system strengthening. These were published just a couple of years ago. Uh, you can see from the introduction that the World Health Organization is, is thinking along the same lines that we are, that many of the functionalities we're describing, they're not a luxury, they're a necessity. If we're going to achieve the, the Millennium Development Goals, uh, the sustainable development goals, if we're going to achieve the, the kinds of eradication of diseases that we'd like, if we weren't going to achieve coverage of things like COVID vaccine, then there are many digital tools that are a necessity. Uh, we simply couldn't get there without them. And they listed in this same document 10 different specific recommendations um, for any digital uh, health system strengthening tool. This was based on a systematic review that they conducted uh, that looked at all of the published literature about digital health interventions and grouped them based on their uh, efficacy and their impact. And you can see that uh, the DHS2 tracker system in specific is able to cover uh, seven or eight of these specific recommendations. And so we, we see that the tracker system is a vital and necessary part, uh, a tool of what many countries can use to achieve their goals. And that these interventions are endorsed by the, the literature, by the World Health Organization, by the best scientific practice. So for these reasons, we spend a lot of time trying to make sure that uh, Tracker fits your needs, that it can be used for the purposes that you would like, and that it can have the maximum impact on the, the health uh, outcomes that you're trying to achieve. But we also know Tracker is difficult. So this is at least my way of thinking about Tracker. This would be a picture of the, the blocks that I had as a kid to build with. You have a, a massive set of possibilities, uh, but your ability to turn this into something beautiful is based on how skilled you are, which can be quite complicated. And we also know that the kinds of systems that you would like to have in many countries are complicated. You would like to have a system that links both the health services and the lab system that is able to do refer referrals and find loss to follow up. You want to send notifications. You want to be able to have all of this data be comparable across sites and with the HMIS system. So there are many different pieces. And when you're staring at Tracker as a pile of possible functionalities, it can be quite daunting. So one of the things that we work with and spend a lot of time on are these WHO health data toolkit packages. So the University of Oslo is a collaborating center with the World Health Organization. For the last uh, four or five years, we've started to put together pre-built configurations of DHIS2 for various health areas. And the way this process works is that we partner with health uh, experts who know the global recommendations, the, the necessary guidelines, the data requirements, the key indicators, and we spend time with them configuring a version of DHS2, which can be shared with the world that meets those requirements, that covers the global recommendations, that produces the key indicators. Um, this is made available through the WHO website, through the DHS2 website. You can see some of the categories that we're working on. Some of these are works in progress. Some of them are already completed and being used by many countries. The packages come with not only the metadata for you to add to your system, but they also come with system design documents, uh, guidance for the installation. Sometimes we even have included with them training materials. So the idea is to make it easier for you to approach DHS2 and be able to use it. It's there for both aggregate and tracker. We're of course focusing in this academy on the tracker use. And quite honestly, tracker is the one that maybe benefits the most from these kinds of packages because tracker is such a complex system to put together well. So I think of these packages more like this rather than that box of parts that you can put together into whatever form you wish. 
A package actually comes with a goal in mind. It has all of the pieces that you need. If you follow the instructions, you can build it exactly out to be the thing that you want. But you also have the opportunity to leave off parts that you don't want or to add in a, a different component that would be useful for your situation. So it's still adaptable, still flexible, but it's meant to make it a little bit easier for you to achieve your goals with Tracker. Just to give you a sense, right as of our last counting, we knew of at least uh, 46 different countries that were using at least one of those packages. Um, many of the countries that you represent are probably here on the board. Many of you may have even worked with some of these packages. If uh, you haven't worked with the packages and you see your country here, you should probably be reaching out to whoever was responsible for using the package and learn from them about the possibilities for tracker packages. The tracker packages include HIV case surveillance, TB case surveillance, malaria elimination, vaccine registries, many different COVID packages. So there are all kinds of pre-built and ready to go tracker packages that you could take advantage of. That footprint um, of 46, if you take a look at Tracker worldwide, there's, there's even more countries that are just using Tracker in some fashion. They've built their own programs, they've linked it to other systems, they've built their own applications. So at this point, we have uh, over 75 countries that are using Tracker on a national scaled approach. Uh, as you can see from kind of the growth chart at the bottom, this has been a massive growth since 2015, 2016 to get to this scale. But that means that in the last four or five years, we've learned a lot about how to implement. Um, many of these countries have gone through the growing pains of trying to make tracker work, of figuring out the complexities of supporting it through the implementation side. And so that's a lot of what we hope to share with you uh, today and in the coming two weeks to make sure that we're giving the best practices and the best examples about how to implement Tracker. Um, widely implemented use cases, just putting a list up here, you'll probably see one of the health areas that you're working on or interested in. Um, these, I would say again, are, are not theoretical so much at this point. These are, these are mostly uh, use cases that have been implemented over and over in various different ways in many different countries. Many of those listed on this slide also have an associated WHO package with them, so you would have an easy starting point. Um, if there isn't a published a, a package associated with the health area you're interested in, you can always go to the community of practice and ask if anybody has covered the health area uh, that you're interested in. Their, their implementation may be a starting point for you. It may be something to learn from, see how they've decided to design their system, see what the resource requirements and support infrastructure have looked like. So really engaging with the community of practice is a good idea, especially if you're starting out now with Tracker. But even if you're already running Tracker, you may be able to learn substantially from, from some of the other countries and the use cases that have been uh, carried out. I was just going to show you a quick map, for example, of uh, immunization data and what a difference this has made. Um, we, we started taking a look at those countries that were collecting immunization data uh, in uh, 2018 and are able to compare that with January of 2021. You can see that uh, we've gone to the point where we have uh, a fully integrated and parallel systems stopped for, for immunization data of 31 by January 2021 meaning that the DHS2 system has been able to be fully integrated. Any parallel system that they were running, uh, whether electronic or on paper, they were able to stop using, and they were able to adopt uh, Tracker for all of those purposes. So I'm, I'm sharing these examples because I, I do want you to know that it's, it's proven and very possible to run these kind of large scale implementations at this point. Uh, you can make use of Tracker to cover many of your existing needs. And that usually the difference between those countries that are successful or those health programs that are successful and those that are not is implementation and the management of the implementation. It's about how you conduct your trainings, how you provide capacity building over time, how you build your IT support team, how you uh, source the, the, the Android devices that you're going to use. So these key considerations we'll be discussing this week will make the difference between whether you're able to make that jump into a fully realized tracker system or whether it ends up just being a pilot that doesn't go very far. Okay, pausing here, there were a lot of questions about this. 
the word of the day today is immunization campaign, which is also why I showed the immunization slide just before this. As a reminder, you can find the attendance uh, link in the Slack channel, um, and you'll be able to fill it out today and use immunization campaign for your word of the day. All right, at this point, I am actually going to stop uh, speaking so much and give you a chance to hear from a number of the countries that are participating in this academy about how they are using uh, the, the tracker application. So I was going to turn it over now to uh, colleagues from Ethiopia to talk us about their laboratory reception tracker app. Um, do you want to share your own screen or would you like me to walk through your slides? Hello, hello, thank you. And we would like to share our screen if that's possible. Great. I will stop sharing on my side and you can share your screen. Okay. So, is it, is it? It's uh, still loading. Your mic. Is it visible? No. Oh, yeah. Now it comes. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, everyone. My name is Nara Kasarit, and I'm from SPK. Currently, we are using the tracker to collect the COVID uh, test results and starting from the collection specimen collection up to the point where we track each individual suspect from uh, from case treatments and up to the discharge stage. So before we started COVID, the COVID pandemic started, DHS2 was being used for aggregate reporting only. But when COVID started and the release of the WHO package by Oslo, we were able to integrate the WHO package, the whole COVID package into Ethiopian, and of course made some customizations. So there was, once the development was started and once specimen was coming in, then there came, there was a months long test campaign in the country that we wanted to collect around 200,000 samples per day, uh, sorry, per month. So this became very large for the both the VHS2 system and also for the laboratories to happen. So tracker capture was a very uh, was a bit cumbersome for us, so that the data collectors were not able to, we were not able to use the data collectors up to their full potentials because it was a bit uh, too much work. So we, in addition to this, there was this high load for specific labs. So one lab, when it uh, when it, re it receives a large batch of specimens, it dispatches it to another uh, another lab. So we had to come up with a solution and what we did was we developed a DHS2 app, a tracker app, to act as one-stop place for approving specimens, distributing those specimens to specific laboratories, and also record the test results. So this is the basic screenshot of the app. What is being done is first we select the org unit and then we select the program. And then we have two stages that is in concern. The first is the laboratory request stage and then second is the result stage. So once uh, for the laboratory request stage, this is the approving stage, the, we select the laboratory that we want to dispatch the specific uh, specimen to, and then we select the number of days that we want to load and we will load it. We added the days because most of the labs might not have a very fast internet connection, so it will just load it once and cache it there. So using that, we. As you can see, there's this uh, basic fields that we can use to search with, but we mostly use the specimen ID. So the specimen ID is read through a barcode. So once the specimen ID is read, the only thing to do is approve or we have an error. This view, are, uh, view error uh, is uh, added here because some of the mandatory fields might not be collected by the specimen collectors who use Android phone to collect the, the basic information about the specimen. So in order to send it to an actual lab, they need to up, uh, to fulfill every mandatory data. And once it is approved, it will be dispatched to the laboratory. So this is the very simple form that we have developed for them. And in order to provide the results, we just uh, go to this result. To this page so this page as you can see the stage is changed from laboratory request to laboratory result 
So the result, we just change the approve button to a drop down button where a user can select the results that he wants. So once the user selects or clicks on the result, that result is saved. So by doing this, we have tried to facilitate for the data importers the input of laboratory results for them. So by doing this, we were able to, by now, we, are, we have about 1.7 million specimens collected in DHIS2 for the COVID. And it is being used by almost all laboratory reception clerks and result encoders across the country. Uh, despite its objective, of course, to facilitate the distribution of parts and also to handle the large load of data being come, we also added, uh, we also have seen additional advantage, like it's now being the main portal to capture results and even additional uh, laboratory requests are coming to us so that we can implement this uh, for COVID, which was done for COVID, to other lab tests as well. And because the specimen collection time and the laboratory uh, reception time and result issue time is collected because we collect what time is uh, the specimen was collected from the collector and also we all collect what time the result was approved that means when it reached to the specific laboratory and also the result that uh, the result issue time we were able to calculate a accurate indicators for TAT or turnaround time this also ensured, the app also ensured for us data completeness because no specimen goes to any lab without being approved first. So in order to approve that specimen or that specific uh, request, it needs to have a complete data. But before the approval stage was, was found to be positive, we, was, we were not able to communicate to them because the result collectors might not uh, fill all the necessary data. They might fill uh, the. They might not fill the phone numbers and things like that. And in addition to that, it takes less than ten seconds for uh, data encoders to enter the lab because they just need to scan the barcode, click on the result, and within a set of two clicks, they will have entered a specific person's results. So this was the additional advantage that we have by developing the. App on top of the track to fair capture that is already existing in DHS. So this is from my side. If there are any questions, I will answer later on. Thank you, Mike. Back. Yeah, thank you so much. So again, if uh, if you have questions, uh, feel free to put them uh, into the the Slack. Uh, we'll we'll have people monitoring, and they can go ahead and answer. Um, if uh, yeah. You're, we just have a link now Martin has put into the chat that will take you to the questions channel. So feel free to put them there. This one was a, a great example of, of being able to build the, the app that works exactly the way that you wanted to uh, for Ethiopia. So thank you for, for sharing that experience. And then hopefully you can uh, monitor the Slack for, for any questions that come up. Okay, with that, I think we will switch over now to uh, Lao. Uh, I'm not sure that John will be presenting or if there's another. Uh, hi all, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, thanks, John. We can see your presentation. Okay. So I'm just going to talk about um, uh, DHS2 tracker use cases uh, in Laos. Uh, just want to, just a quick presentation, um, just a brief idea about how we are using tracker program in Laos and what it took to use uh, DHS tracker in uh, in Laos. Uh, Laos uh, PDR is um, We've been working with, with them from quite some time, uh, both in Mr. Fosla and his Vietnam and supporting a lot. Um, and we started uh, with, um, as normal DHS to start, we started with aggregate and then we worked on the event. And then in uh, two, uh, two, two years back, or oh, three years back, we started with, um, with the tracker program. Um, these are the different tracker programs, what we try to use. We started with the malaria case investigation uh, program um, and then the foci, uh, and then the TB, and then the TB contact uh, examination and the tracking. Uh, 
uh, um, HIV uh, ERT treatment. And now uh, when COVID started, it was a COVID surveillance, uh, contact tracing, port of entry and vaccine registration. So these are all the programs what we started with. <clears throat> but um, Lao, the one good advantage about Lao was DHRS2 was, um, was made as a national system and everyone agreed that like the DHRS2 system will be the official source for, for all the data. So we had quite a lot of buy-in from the ministry itself. And also we did lots of um, work with um, WHO and other development partners to bring them together and see uh, more than their only uh, program, but also uh, the whole health system strengthening. Um, so what we learned from the this years of Lao tracker implementation is uh, we need a um, health system strengthening approach even for tracker, even for when we want to implement a simple, let's like, say malaria program or COVID or anything. Um, we need to make sure that like everyone understand it is not like one tracker program. It is like we have many other tracker program will come on. So we need to talk with all the health program people and just get a common agreement, just even for uh, patient demographic. Shall we collect first name or last name, uh, sex, uh, education, um, occupation? So we want to synchronize uh, so all the things so that like we don't duplicate. And most of the time, what we just see in many, uh, many places that we have occupation for HIV, which is different occupation for um, uh, malaria is different. And also we try to combine all the things and just say we are, we have key common um, patient demographic de details, which every health program should collect. They can also collect additional um, attributes, patient attributes. That's not a problem, but at least these five key program uh, uh, demographic details they have to collect in each and every tracker program that was something common agreement we tried to, to deal with and also support mechanism uh, it was a national core team a group of um, 11 people at the national level uh, combining from different um, um, programs who lao team um, uh, ministry of health the department of planning and finance um, and also uh, health program people. So they allocated a couple of members to be a part of core team who've been trained in, in Tracker and also in DHS too, and try to manage and maintain. Uh, we also did lots of coordination and collaboration with all the development partners and national stakeholders. It's because as and when things happen, people want to introduce many new programs and other things, but they first need to understand what can Tracker do and what cannot do. Uh, that's one of the, the main things. Sometimes people just come down, can you please include this particular logistic thing into your system? We just say, no, sorry, you have M supply, you have other things, please use that one. And what DHS can, tracker can do is tracking a particular uh, patient or a lab sample or things or a period of time and produce health program analytics. It is not a hospital management system. It is not um, a complete um, uh, patient record. Even we collect patient details, but that is specific for that particular program and all. Uh, other thing what we learned is we require quite a lot of um, server support and access because like as and when things are updating and changes, we also need to monitor quite a lot on the server, the, the logs and other things. That was the few things which we, we looked up to. Um, for this session, uh, what I'll try to present is a um, few things. One thing is on the um, COVID uh, self-registration vaccine and the screening and ICD uh, app, which has already been presented. So I won't going to do the demo, but like, I just like uh, talk about it. Uh, just to talk about the COVID self-registration right now, like Lao has been doing all the, the COVID vaccination, um, but there have been an enormous workload at the um, uh, health side. So people have to enter all the different details, the, um, the patient demographic details, and also a uh, few medical um, uh, things. So what we tried to do was is to create a, um, a website, uh, external app, which enters all the different data, but stores the data in DHS to program itself directly. Um, and then uh, it also allows public to check whether the health authority have accepted the status, uh, mm -hmm. whether it is pending or approved. It also reduces the data work, in, uh, data work um, data workload on the health worker side so that like they can just like do the screening, not deal with uh, all entering all the patient demographic details and other things. Um, and then provide vaccination uh, report. We don't say vaccination certificate because we'll work with 
DIWOC and other people and uh, with um, uh, University of Foster to make the vaccination certificate, but we are still just producing a simple vaccination report with QR code where they can try to find the things. So, um, the solution basically exists in uh, external website, which I will just show you very shortly. And then public can just like enter the uh, check the status and, and everything. And uh, after that one, health official, they just like log into DHIS2 as they normal do. And then like uh, say how many people have been self-registered and then they enter and all the different things. Uh, this is actually, it's not a generic app because it's been customized quite a lot for Lao itself because not all the health facilities are providing the vaccination and not all the health facility will allow uh, self-registration. So there are few health facilities and also only on few particular days and timing the allow the, um, uh, the vaccine registration. Um, just to quickly to show you on that, you can all see my screen. So this is the, the law version of self-registration. So where people just like fill in all the different details, their first name, last name, and all the different things, uh, select the province where they have been, uh, answer some of the things, and plus select the, the site. Uh, so when they select the site, only allocated date will be shown. Uh, this is uh, May 27th. And when they select that one, the slot will be shown on which, what kind of slot are available at what dates. Uh, based on that one, they can just select and register it. Once they register, SMS is sent to, to their phone with their ID and all, and then they can check their, uh, their status. I'll just like um, show a few things on that. It's... This is uh, some, this again, it's all uh, demo and test site, so it's not real data. So this one is uh, is checking for the, the site and just like gets um, the status. So this particular person has been approved from the system and then they can do the, all the data entry and everything. Uh, that's the, um, the, that's for the public. And now I'm just like trying to show how, um, what happens in DHIS2. So in DHIS2, what we have done is to create a, um, a simple app, which is basically DHIS2 itself, uh, but just to make sure like we have the um, uh, self-registration things done. So every time when the self-registered is there, so it will show around here, list of all the, the registered people. Uh, we will not give any kind of COVID number because that's the workflow. So self-registration will not get any uh, number. They will do the, the check and screening. They will ask where they are, what kind of things are, or the phone, all the things. Only when they approve, they will select which team is going to vaccinate and what is the, uh, the number where they are allocated. Once they are given, then this number is allocated to a particular person and then they can do the screening and vaccination and also give the same date. Whether they can come to the same date, what they have suggested to, or if they want to reschedule, they can just do that one based on the available needs. That's basically uh, how the system works so that a uh, health worker don't have to enter any of these details and nor we need to maintain separate system for COVID registration because when they do all the data entry, it's directly going into DHS to tracker program um, and storing all the data. And the rest, all the different stages, like screening and the vaccination stages is filled by um, health worker. This is the one of the use cases what we've been trying to adopt. Uh, as uh, Mike mentioned, uh, you don't really have to use all these things, but when we have uh, different cases, so you can try to modify also a tracker to use to satisfy your own needs. Um, just going back, um, we also try to, this is another custom app for ICD-11 for cost of death. We've been working with the WHO HQ and with University of Foster try to make sure uh, when they install, many countries are trying to use the ICD app. Um, we want try to give a, a more customizable um, solution where country can uh, test, uh, install the ICD-11 app based on their country settings and country DHS to, um, configuration. And, and then like it will also gives uh, analysis tool like export to Anacor or built-in dashboard, which is um, 
basically a few additional source which we've been working with WHO on grouping the uh, the data based on ICD-11 chapters. Yeah, that's basically all from me. If you have any question, please uh, write in the Slack or things. I'll try to happy to respond. Thanks, Mike. It's okay. Good morning. My name is Oswald Dashaga. I work with the Ghana Health Service and a member of the Team Stewart Technical Team. Uh, making this presentation alongside Kwame, who is also on the call. So for Ghana, we have been doing tracker implementation in the early parts of 2016 up to now. As far as DHIS is concerned, we have been uh, a team that have started using it very much early from 2012. Uh, largely, our deployment objective, especially for the tracker system, have largely been based on trying to reduce uh, errors and omissions uh, during data collection and entries by health facilities, and sort of trying to be able to automate our data gathering system across health facilities and move gradually towards a paperless system. And so the tracker system came in handy for us and uh, it's been doing so well for us for some specific programs for now but as uh, i've mentioned our main system actually uh, using the aggregate system the teams too and all these fall in line with our strategy as a country of uh, ensuring that there is universal access to healthcare services and also improving on the efficiency of the services that we provide across the country now there are three major areas that we have implemented tracker in Ghana. The uh, first one had to do with uh, maternal and child health, where we are tracking antenatal care delivery, postnatal, and then child welfare, and as well as growth promotion services. And this is being implemented in about uh, a number of regions in country. We also have uh, the TB surveillance and case management uh, module, which is also on tracker and it's also able to help us track all susceptible TB cases and also track their treatment as well as outcomes. And the third one has to do with HIV, which we have also implemented for all ART sites. This also helps us to do tracker clients, uh, track all clients that are on treatment and are assessing their medications on, uh, at our various ART sites. There is also a plan to, of course, uh, track all clients that are on the uh, HIV testing and counseling uh, session. So, as I mentioned, our scope have uh, largely been for MCH, HIV, and then TB. And for MCH, currently five regions out of the 16 regions in Ghana are implementing it, using it for client management and tracking, as well as being able to generate service reports in aggregate form that then allows us to be able to move that into our main repository, which is the aggregate system. HIV is implemented in about 586 ART sites. And as I mentioned, it's also used for client management and able to schedule appointments for uh, ART clients to come for their medication and able to also track missed opportunities to then uh, allow uh, care providers to do default tracing and be uh, sure that everybody that is supposed to take their medications are able to get them on a timely manner. We also are able to generate some useful response, including uh, clients currently on treatment and all that, and those are great outputs for our HIV program. For ATC clients, uh, we are yet to fully deploy that, and the target is around uh, a little uh, short of 5,000 health facilities, and uh, we are currently initiating processes towards deploying that uh, uh, functionality and area. For TB, we are implementing in about 348 facilities, and those are those include hospitals and uh, district hospitals as well. It tracks all uh, TB clients that are on treatment and also uh, generate uh, outcome reports as well. This again, we are able to generate all our 
uh, aggregate reports, our TB08 and then TB07 reports that then feeds into DIMS2. Now, running and using Tracker for us have come with a lot of sources, but it also uh, comes with its own challenges. On the side of logistics, one of the key challenges we've largely faced had to do with the acquisition of these electronic devices, that is 100 tablets that you'll be able to use to do a full nationwide deployment. And that has uh, to come with a lot of funding and even their management. Then the funding for training of healthcare providers is also another critical area that you need to look at. Then of course, change management, the fact that people are used to capturing their data manually and then now you are asking them to capture data using an Android uh, device and all that, it comes with its own uh, challenges. Then of course, the stability of the tracker app for offline data capture. This I must say have improved largely with the recent releases of the Android app, but it still uh, is a challenge for uh, facilities that are not able to acquire tablets that meets a certain minimum standard. Then uh, they have functionality challenges. Then the abuses, abuse of devices by end users, because we do know that uh, once you are not able to control and manage these devices while using MDMs, then end users install all sort of apps on it, then the tablets begin to run slow and that affects the functionality of the device. And MDMs also do not come cheap. So uh, it's one area that we think that if uh, UIO is uh, a lot more involved, we should be able to solve that problem so that we at least restrict a lot of the unauthorized apps that get into the tablets and affect the functionality of the Android app. Now, one of uh, some of the ways we have largely uh, tried to use to improve and overcome these challenges had to do with engagement with partners to support us in the acquisition of the tablets and all the deployments we have done currently for MCA, TB and HIV have largely being from the support of partners for the acquisition of the Android uh, devices. Progressive deployment instead of a one-time deployment. In Ghana, we say we do not do pilot, we do progressive deployment because uh, piloting usually will come with its own challenges. So what we do is to plan and move a region at a time or a district at a time and cover the entire uh, country as and when resources are available. Another critical thing we have done is to design and deploy in such a way that it meets the needs of the service providers and communicate exactly the importance of how it can help them to enhance their service provision. And once you do that and do that very well, all stakeholders are able to get the buy-in and uh, the interest is built up and they are able to help you uh, implement successfully. As I indicated uh, recently, the latest uh, version of the Android app have been last, largely uh, successful and we are currently using it for some implementations and it's so far stable than the previous ones. We have also uh, initiated some integrating efforts and uh, in one of our regions, we have been able to successfully integrate the HIV e tracker with a PCR machine for viral load tests. And so once uh, a test request is done by the health facilities, it's transmitted uh, directly to the health facilities uh, that have the capacity to run these tests using the PCR machines. And once the results are made available uh, from the PCR machine, it is then uh, posted directly onto tracker without uh, a health service provider and intervention. And for us, that is something quite great to share. And currently there are plans to expand it to other regions and gradually make it available to the entire country. So to conclude, what I would like to say is that uh, the electronic systems in, 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 in themselves do not improve your cost. Of course, they are good tools that helps you to improve your health service a delivery and data capture. But what is critical is the human beings that run the system. And for that, we always say that you need champions, especially among the end users who will own the system and run it as if they have started it. They become a reference point where other service providers then learn from and indicate that, well, if my colleague is using it and is producing uh, results, why not? I can also use it and 
it largely improves and uh, aid other people to get a buy-in and support your implementation. So the attitude towards the system is critical. And uh, what say that the quality of data from any information management system largely depends on the interest of the leadership as well. If you have a national leadership that are interested in outputting the of the data in the best of quality, then of course you have their buy-in and they are able to communicate a lot more in the advocacy uh, uh, areas as far as uh, getting people to accept the use of tracker and all other systems that we are deploying is concerned. So for us in Ghana, this is what we are doing for now and uh, we are always available to share these experiences. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Oswald. So we, we've had uh, a number of questions coming in through Slack and maybe we can we can take a moment to address some of those. I, uh, there will be a few for you and uh, Kwame about uh, the Ghana one, but maybe first, if John Lewis is still on, there was a, a question about how you were able to publicize the availability of the self-registration tool. How did how was it made uh, known to the people that they could use that for self-registration? So John, that was a question for you if you're still around with us, John Lewis. All right, maybe he's, he's uh, not. Yeah, don't, oh. don't send me an answer actually. Uh, so I posted that on the Slack. Okay, great. Uh, in the question from Abdul Rahman. All right, I'm pulling it up now. So John says about the self-registration app, we still use the WHO COVID vaccination package. Only a few things are customized for Lao. What we try to do is to remove Lao specific details and share. We also work with the Oslo team on how best we can release it. Okay, so that was speaking more specifically to maybe how to share the self-registration app that you have in terms of being others being able to make use of it and maybe adapt it for their own use. Um, if you're uh, still with us and, and are able to answer at some point the question about how do you make it aware to the general public that they can use self-registration. But then otherwise, uh, maybe we'll go on to some of the questions that have come up for Ghana. Uh, one of the questions from uh, Peter Ricketts was about uh, Ghana, how are you managing your data dictionary? Uh, do you have a dedicated team and tool that is being used? How do you ensure that the metadata kind of across these different uh, tracker packages is standardized? So Oswald or uh, Kwame, I don't know if you have uh, anything you'd like to say there. So for, for, for Ghana, what... Uh we are doing is that, as I mentioned, DIMS2, which is our main repository for aggregate system, is our master uh, instance that has uh, our org unit structure and a lot of metadata that we then use on other tracker instances. They run separately. HIV and TB uh, tracker run on the same instance. The maternal and child health also runs on a separate instance. Then we have the DIMS2, which runs also on a separate instance but largely all the tracker instances uh, borrow their uh, metadata and resources uh, as in org units and other structures from the main one. Then it becomes a lot more easier to integrate and then transmit data across these systems. But we do not, uh, for instance, uh, currently, if you have a pregnant mother uh, on the MCH system who is HIV positive, currently the two are not linked. So you will have to register this pregnant matter on the HIV instance as well to be able to provide HIV care. Thank you. Great. So that was a bit of a response to both of those questions that had come up about whether the tract entities are shared across the instances and where you keep your terminology service. These are these are both again very important implementation questions when you're deciding uh, to to set up your first tracker implementation. It would be useful to think of a data dictionary approach where you try to standardize the, the formatting of how you set up your data elements, your analytics, your program indicators. And then as you continue to add on more tracker instances or you're sharing this data with the HMIS, again, having someone whose responsibility is to keep terminology synced, uh, to do your best to reuse uh, the metadata that you can, uh, because these things get really messy very quickly. Ghana has, of course, had a lot of experience using uh, Tracker, but even so, I'm sure that this has been part of the challenge is to try to make sure that uh, the, the data terminology is staying uh, in sync and is uh, 
making sense across systems. And of course, the other decision about sharing of tracked entities. So it's very common uh, for a set of services to have a natural link where a, a woman is being targeted and you would like her to be able to receive services in a single instance that combines perhaps the ANC care or malaria care, uh, HIV care. But there's also considerations of access control and wanting to ensure that, for example, something like the HIV data perhaps should be on a separate instance, depending on what your legislation is, depending on who the users are. So again, many of these are, are implementation considerations. They, they don't have to be the technology consideration so much. Uh, the technology is there to share these tracked entities across programs, but it's more of a question about what you want to achieve and who should have access. Okay. So maybe at this point, uh, Sakibo, if uh, you're willing and ready to share, I think you were going to share your own screen. So is it possible to see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. It's in the kind of notes uh, view, but we can still see the slides. Ah, okay. So maybe what I can do, just uh, one minute uh, to do it again. Okay, fine. I think now it is fine. Yes, is this okay good. now? Yes. Okay. So thank you, everyone. So my name is Sakibo, working for his Western Central Africa. So we were working on uh, what we call the disease surveillance uh, tracker for uh, uh, package team, and uh, we start doing something you know, for two countries, Mali and Togo, actually. So, basically, in most of them, so for uh, DC surveillance reporting, it is the same in uh, several countries. The first thing is for them is uh, to make uh, identification of the cases after to make notification. But only after, uh, after the notification, they can do the sample collection, going to the lab side and uh, to have uh, the results. And they finally get uh, the classification. But uh, there is something important for them. It is uh, they have to submit those the information to WHO. So for Africa side, uh, it will be WHO Afro. But something uh, we learn from them here is uh, those countries are still working on uh, paper form. And uh, most of them, uh, after the paper form, are submitting data in APM4 for electronic uh, data. But um, usually, they don't do it uh, at the end level side, uh, but they are doing it uh, at the central level. Because a lot of people, uh, a lot of uh, uh, end users doesn't uh, have been trained on that. But something we, we also found is uh, that uh, even they are notifying information into APM4, the data from laboratories are, have their own database. So if uh, you go to the country now, you can find a one database where you have the notification information and directly the information based on uh, laboratory uh, results. So actually what, that is uh, one of uh, their form. And the reform based on a PM4, it is based on each disease. You can find a PM4 form for meningitis and another PM4 form for AFP and measles and so forth. And the same things for the lab information also. So what we decided to do and based on our WHO recommendation is to have what we call VPG packages and actually we have uh, until nine diseases inside many HISs, measles, rotavirus and so forth. And actually we have only one tracker dealing with uh, those nine diseases. Okay. And as you can see here, you will have uh, a way to register a person. And now we have also the way to really manage uh, the PM4, not uh, automatically, but uh, we design what we call the program vault for validation pattern to be sure that uh, each countries will have the same way to deal with uh, the uh, EPID number since uh, we will have to send them to WHO side. So this was uh, something we call standards now. So we need, uh, we are working on that. 
But for the formula side, uh, you, you will have the way now to of submitting data for the info clinical information, but also the lab information also. So now, based on the tracker abilities, we can have those information in the same form, in the same database. So, and what you have, or we have already a demo instance for that. So if uh, guys, we want to, you can go there and uh, test by yourself uh, what we already done based on this uh, VPG package. So what is the plan for Togo now? So for Togo, in the first time, they are thinking to still send in the perform from the facilities at the district, but the district now will have this ability to enter the data based on DHS2 at the district level, not uh, in the past at the central level, but uh, they want something we call the rumor management. This way, it will allow population themselves, uh, if they found uh, something based on surveillance, to send SMS. And this SMS will be go through the DHS2. Uh, and uh, this will have something uh, based on events, uh, based on what we can send notification to some medical person that know some kind of population found uh, a surveillance issue somewhere. So we, we have already that uh, designed into our system, not uh, include the packages, but for Togo initially, we have actually that for them. And uh, there are discussion with uh, WHO, we will start the uh, end users training uh, among uh, next uh, month, I guess. That's for Mali. Mali actually have uh, had uh, in the past, uh, something based on uh, CBS, but uh, they were like uh, some kind of uh, one form per uh, disease. But actually they, they, they decide to use uh, these packages because uh, they have all in all uh, in one place. And since uh, they, those packages is coming from with dashboard also. So everything is uh, designed actually for them. And uh, the next step for them is to train and users, and uh, they can start uh, submitting data with that. But we're still uh, in discussion with uh, Cameroon. Cameroon will start uh, with uh, this package in July. And I know that uh, there is a discussion actually for Rwanda also to start using those packages. So for the specific next plan for our side is uh, uh, to help them to train uh, user. But also we found that uh, since uh, laboratory have their own application, we are thinking about to, to do what we call the interoperability with uh, their own system and uh, the DHS2 BPG packages. So if they don't want to go to the DHS2 and to feel results, they can still working with uh, their own database and uh, based on their interoperability uh, aspect, uh, we can send those information directly to the BPG uh, forms that uh, since uh, what they are doing in the past, all the countries, after some period, they have to send their MP info data to the data wise, uh, data uh, Afro wire wise. So what we decide now to do is uh, we are we're implementing some kind of uh, data push up. This way will allow countries their self store based on this app. Uh, based on DHS2, of course, to send their data they, they collect uh, for VPG directly to the regional Afro warehouse. That is uh, what uh, I decided to share with you guys, and uh, thank you. Great, thank you very much, Sagibo. Uh, just in the in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to the next uh, country quickly. But again, please do continue to put questions into the Slack. We'll we'll answer there, and if we have time, we'll also bring up some more of the questions for the participants to speak to. But uh, Sakibo, if you can also keep your eye on the chat, see if uh, any questions come up for you. And then we were going to do uh, Rwanda next. If uh, I believe Adolf is going to do the presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, 
Good afternoon, good morning to everyone. Uh, this is Adolf Kamugunga uh, working with HISP Rwanda. So I'm going to take you through about uh, the Rwanda use case implementing a DHIS tracker. So allow me to, to share my screen for quick jump to what I prepared for you. So do you all see my, my screen? Yes. Okay, so as uh, so for what I have prepared for the audience today is uh, Rwanda has been implementing a DHS tracker uh, or experiencing DHS tracker app since 2014, uh, whereby I started implementing uh, the TB tracker, and the API tracker. Uh, so for the sake of this uh, uh, experience sharing, uh, I have prepared to share the COVID surveillance uh, whereby we adopted and consider the, the WHO package uh, developed to support countries uh, to monitor uh, cases, COVID cases. Uh, so this is what I'm going to share with you now. Uh, showing and demo, uh, showing how Rwanda go, went to paperless using the choice to manage COVID cases. So as you can see uh, from this slide, so uh, when COVID came out, uh, as you are aware, WHO and the University of Oslo uh, developed uh, and, and shared a, a package to support uh, COVID case management. Uh, helping countries to to see uh, to register cases, to record uh, lab requests. Whether uh, by then it was a PCR test, and also be able to capture lab results. And Rwanda went ahead and also configured SMSs uh, and emails as a notifications for for every single case uh, identified in the country. So as you are aware, DHIS to have access to DHIS, you need to have logins, username and password. So the, with, uh, with, uh, in the collaboration with the coordination team uh, in Rwanda, the task force in charge of uh, managing uh, case management, COVID case management, we came up with an idea of having a self-registration uh, interface whereby any single uh, traveler willing to come to, to Kigali or to Rwanda can have an interface to register him or, him, he or herself so that uh, directly demographic information uh, and information related to price details, uh, hotel reservations uh, are sh directly shared with, the, with the, the country DHS instance so that as soon as a passenger or a visitor reaches to the airport is directly uh, found into the DHIS package, into the DHS instance, uh, managing uh, uh, COVID cases. So whether you are a case, whether you are not a case, so whoever was willing to travel to, to Rwanda since then, uh, have to pass through this travel allocator form, which is a self-registration form, uh, share the, the demographic information, and by then, uh, all those information are automatically uh, uh, pushed to DHIS instance through uh, DHIS APIs to for agents at the airport and at the entry points to directly fill the rest of information, including uh, uh, related to, HR, to to COVID case management. So when after customizing uh, that uh, WHO package, I'm, I'm sure maybe most of you are aware of that package. So people has to know the outcome of uh, the, 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 the sample, uh, uh, sample assessment 
the specimen assessment. So since to, to, to facilitate the, the, the client or the, 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 the passengers to, to see the outcome of the, the tests, so we, we have developed together with the guy, we have developed the, the platform, the portal, whereby a passenger can, the uh, passenger can have, without having a username and a password to the HIS instance, can use the unique identifier provided by the DHS instance and the phone number provided during the registration can go to that portal to see the, the test results without visiting or going back to, to RAB facilities. Uh, also from that DHS instance for COVID case management, uh, when passengers arrives in the in the country, they have to be kept for uh, 74 hours to a quarantine, identified quarantine hotels. And also we found that it's more relevant to have a hotel dashboard because we, 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 we would, with the country didn't want to share, uh, to give access to, to national DHIS instance for hotels managers to always go and see uh, the COVID test results. So we also, a portal has been customized to, for, for the hotel and also for the hotel tenants to, for themselves to, to assess and see the results when they're out. And also the, the, the hotel managers to see how many uh, hotel residents, uh, the results are, are out. And if they're out, what are the, the status? If they are positive, so they are uh, depending on the, the period. So nowadays, uh, the COVID treatment is home, is home and, and unless for the serious sick people uh, who are kept at the clinics, but uh, if there are no major symptoms, uh, people are allowed to be self-contained uh, in, in their home until uh, they are cured and follow the the instructions given to by the Rwanda Biomedical Center. Also from that uh, COVID uh, management uh, 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 tracker, we had, you know, uh, Rwanda is a landlocked country. So uh, whereby most of the uh, goods uh, uh, shipping come in through roads. So truck drivers had to get a, a travel pass and to get the travel pass, also they have to uh, to share that information with the the regional East Africa uh, platform. Or for every truck driver uh, tested in Rwanda from uh, recognized the RAB facilities, and when the PCR tester comes out negative, uh, so that person can get a, a pass in a form of certificate. Uh, in the form of certificate for, for, for that driver to, to transit from, a, uh, from Rwanda to any neighboring uh, country towards to um, Mombasa or Dar es Salaam uh, ports. So the, also uh, the, the, the DHIS uh, COVID registry also helped to support a number of social uh, activities, including the e-ticketing whereby any any organizer or any provider who is planning to to uh, to offer or to 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 run any social event needs to have like the e-ticketing system to buy tickets and in order to get tickets to so the system consult the national covid 19 registry for 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 the status we so for the started to ensure that this person purchasing the ticket is uh, is not positive. So, so as a quick an overview of uh, how far the implementation is for now, and what makes this implementation the most successful, there is a national coordination mechanism put in place by the government, whereby there is a national joint task force. Uh, that has uh, multiple uh, departments. Among the others, there is a data science unit in charge of uh, coordinating this uh, DHIS 
to based uh, uh, case management, the COVID case management system. So the system has been rolled out uh, countrywide, uh, uh, over 50, uh, 550 public facilities and uh, private clinics have access. Uh, so um, uh, initially, uh, the, private, the private clinics were not in the list, but as we, the government initiated the rapid test for COVID-19, that's when the, the private facility just came in to, to facilitate the rapid test across uh, in country but as you are aware they for the extent the international travelers so they are uh, supposed to do pcr test and it's only done in eight pcr testing sites also integrated into the his so with so as uh, we implement uh, the this covid 19 uh, case management uh, package people even though uh, we have been using uh, DHIS tracker since 2014. So we had to pass through a number of uh, uh, online sessions to make sure that all information are well captured into the system. And also uh, uh, lab results, lab uh, information are, compl are, are complete the system for the system to generate certificates. So we also leverage on the existing e-learning platform of the Ministry of Health to make sure every data collector and every system user from whether from lab uh, pass the e-learning course to make sure that understand uh, the basics to use uh, the system, to use and capture uh, COVID case information into the system. At this moment, the, with regard to this COVID case management, over 700 uh, handsets are being used to, 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 to capture information. So you understand the workload and the synchronization uh, difficulties when it comes to, to synchronize uh, outreach or uh, to, to synchronize at the end of the day all, vac all tested uh, individuals. Uh, so as I said, the package also is SMS and email notification enabled, especially this uh, SMS certification are mostly, uh, mostly uh, attached to any legislation and uh, results. So it means for if you are registered by a data collector at any facility, or if you are using this uh, passenger locator form as a self-registered person, you automatically get an SMS and an email uh, notifying you with uh, your unique identification code provided by the DHIS uh, package, and also an SMS, uh, uh, we, uh, an SMS with that code, but also uh, with uh, uh, on your phone number shared. So you can get that uh, SMS on your phone or on email. So and that I, in the case- Sorry, yes, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. I just I, we we're running a little low on time at this point. And we have one more country. I'm, can you do you do you think you can jump maybe to some of your lessons and challenges just for a minute or two? And then of yes, course we'll, yes. we'll be sharing your slides. And this is I really appreciate it. This is a, a great example from Rwanda of a very integrated kind of system. So please do ask questions for Rwanda in the Slack and Adolf if you can follow up there. And we'll we'll of course share the slides. But yes, if you can yes. just take a moment or two okay. and then we'll we'll have time for Mozambique. So as a lesson learned and what maybe you can take you can share with the audience is. Uh, the, we, we found that the use of the unique identifier uh, help us to especially to to trace the the specimen across, especially because we are having uh, people being uh, tested uh, from different facilities. So the unique identifier help us to 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 share to 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 use the system whether from the first the, the 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 point of collection of specimens and also at the tracking the specimen at the lab facilities. Of course, the use of this package helps us to improve uh, the management of cases and also uh, uh, provision and sharing information to whoever needs information, uh, whether for certificates, uh, sh uh, sharing, and also to uh, any uh, uh, 
person who needs uh, COVID test results. Of course, uh, we realize that the multidisciplinary team uh, managing the COVID cases is also very key if you want to be more successful. Of course, uh, we found that even though this package has been developed, you know, the technology can solve, uh, uh, can solve everything. So there's sometimes you need to uh, change a little bit to the existing workflow to make sure that the technology is, is, uh, is fits into the existing uh, workflow. So as the challenge uh, that we can share with the, the audience, as a start, you, we struggled with the, of course, server settings and the specifications that has been uh, improved as we move forward. And also uh, maybe the big thing is uh, as we're using the handsets, synchronization wasn't really a straightforward uh, process, especially when we are tracking, we, are, we want to capture photos for, for registered cases. And also uh, with the internet connectivity that is uh, not really so stable in developing countries. The other challenge that maybe you can share with you is the use of the limited, here you find where we've been synchronizing with the lab information systems, whereby you find it has its own uh, requirements. For example, it requires to have six digits as a unique ID. And as you are aware, when you're using tablets, some it, the tablets kept uh, like, uh, depending on how you set it, number of UIDs for a very specific tablet. So when you have, let's say, 700 tablets across, so you may easily run out of calls that uh, sometimes you have to synchronize, do sync, data sync and configuration sync. So in summary, uh, that's what I can say as uh, uh, some of the challenges we face in Rwanda with regards to implementation of this COVID package, uh, COVID, uh, COVID management package uh, uh, developed uh, in collaboration with the OWHO and University of Oslo. Over, thank you. Have questions? Maybe you can get them in Slack or in the chats. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's always great to see what's going on in Rwanda. So yes, please do put questions into, uh, into the Slack channel. Again, we will continue to answer questions even after the session ends. We, uh, we don't have a lot of time left, but we do have one more country that we wanted to hear from the, the lessons uh, and the way that they're using Tracker. Uh, I think Emilio is going to share with us from Mozambique. Uh, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, I will, if you allow me, I will share uh, the presentation. I hope you can see it. Yes, we can see it. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, um, the, um, my name is Emilio Moss and I'm part of the, the group that uh, is based in Mozambique. Uh, but I should say also that Mozambique is responsible, the team in Mozambique is responsible for Lusophony countries. I mean, uh, Cabo Verde, uh, San Tome, Guinea-Bissau and Angola. So we've been doing a lot of uh, 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 work in these different places, but uh, in this case, I will be sharing examples from modern. So DHS track ecosystems here uh, will provide uh, overview. So uh, the Minister of Health has adopted official uh, the DHS in 2015. So one, one year later, the, the ministry start to engage uh, in DHS track implementation, CCTV for tracking uh, pests. Uh, also, uh, there was a development on the host for hospital inpatient in death registration. I should say that this, this uh, uh, project here, it was interoperated with the Minister of Justice database. Uh, uh, during the COVID was also a CISCOVID for COVID-19 surveillance and vaccine delivery. Also with integrated disease surveillance and response, leprosy patient tracking. All this uh, 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 implementation uh, took place during uh, the, uh, the, uh, the last, uh, I mean, a few years 
after the adoption of the so that the many of these uh, implementation that are taking place and apps have been developed to support users in Mozambique, for example, ECHO in Guinea-Bissau and Gambia, for example, for COVID surveillance, Cabo Verde, COVID surveillance and stock management of vaccine. In Angola, we are using uh, a community health uh, information system interoperability with the uh, Cobo Colette, that is a system that exists in Angola. And in San Tome, uh, where we are currently based now, uh, I, should, I should think that the connection today is, is, is quite okay because this is one of the challenges that we talk about. We talk a bit. We also developed COVID-19 surveillance systems and hospital management systems. Uh, we should say that uh, in these different countries, there are kind of a pressure to provide to include more application uh, uh, using a tracker. Uh, even yesterday, we had a meeting uh, here in San Tome that is asking for to include more uh, more areas of health within the hospital to be a uh, tracker. Yeah. Um, in terms of objective, you know, while some has target specific area, this, this, this track implementation, most of them has been implemented national and aimed at strength in case based reporting system, like managing uh, clients of different services, tracking of patients in order to improve adherence and reduce loss of uh, follow ups. Uh, for example, most of these TB patient, HIV patient uh, should be recorded, uh, should be remembered uh, or reminded to come to hospital to take uh, uh, medication, track client medication, assess, monitor patient treatment process, history and his related data, improve the quality of data being reported. Uh, so this is very important issue here because uh, uh, there's a, a team who is really uh, uh, is working in, in terms of uh, uh, to provide the quality of data that has been uh, circulating uh, uh, through this tracker system. Um, to speed also access to data, for instance, HOSP system currently in sending data to Ministry of Justice, system for death notification and certificate issue. Uh, so this is uh, what we, we, we can consider as uh, one of the smart uh, 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 project within uh, Mozambique. Uh, patient information sharing also, uh, among, among different programs, health programs. So the second objective here is to re relate individual level data with aggregate data being reported from same facility. Uh, this is also very interesting uh, uh, work that we have been doing because uh, most of the, uh, the, the program, they want a tracker. But if you go to uh, uh, the management of the hospital or the program, they want this to be tracked special now that we have this uh, immunization. Uh, so uh, jumping uh, to, to, to lesson, I think that's uh, um, because we are dealing with many, many, many programs in different countries. So we, we come up really uh, to observe that the project should be led by Minister of Health with clear objectives, plan and available resource. Most of the countries, the, the, uh, I mean, the team is there, but uh, 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 some of the countries, some of the project, they don't have enough resources. Uh, uh, they are not, they don't have uh, human resources that can really uh, provide with a good plan or to, and with clear objective. So I think that this is, uh, uh, is one of the big challenges that we face uh, among our implementation or during our implementation should also allow engagement of partner and be support to project objective in terms of coordination and collaboration, creating task forces. Um, most of the, 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 the health programs in, in our countries are supported by different partners. Uh, in some cases, uh, it's very easy for, 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 for program to ask for, for any support, but in other countries, uh, uh, this support is really take time to, to come. And uh, we see that uh, in the countries or in the programs, the, 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 the partners are more flexible. Uh, things are, are, are really working. Yeah. Uh, so this is it's very important to engage the partner in order to support these uh, different uh, uh, objectives to, 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 to make the, 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 the project working. Capacity building is a key, as we, as we said before. It's being supportive and available uh, whenever support is required. 
So, um, uh, I mean, we, we, we uh, the, 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 the team of Mozambique is, it's, it's responsible for, 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 to support the different countries. And uh, what we're doing is really to create different teams in these different countries. Uh, but uh, here we, we are really finding a very, very serious, really this team in order to take over uh, uh, the health information system. So uh, we think that this capacity building is really a key issue that should be addressed during implementation uh, of, uh, of trackers. So developing uh, DHS two custom apps to respond to specific user needs that are not natively responded by DHS tracker, like for example, site map in echo and Excel export in TB DRS. I mean, uh, uh, one thing is that the, the, the core DHS tracker uh, is responding for, for, for some kind of a specific issue. But the, when we go to, uh, 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 to, to different organizations, they, they, they really want something very specific that uh, the, the DHS core tracker should be adapted for these specific needs. Uh, flat the COVID-19 uh, surveillance and, and vaccine delivered. Uh, the Minister of Health was waiting for internet for them from this from its partner, but uh, this this waiting was was really very long. So in that in these cases, the the, the universal force and this managed to secure the, to secure internet to get things moving. So uh, uh, with a partner with our big partner like Universal Force, we manage really to, 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 to implement the, the checker surveillance uh, system uh, in Mozambique. Uh, sorry, um, uh, so here in, in, in order of adding, most of the, the, the presentation that uh, came up before our presentation uh, really express a lot of uh, applications that is taking place in different, in, in their own country. But here we focus on the on Mozambique. But there is one also very interesting application app that we, I would like really to emphasize that uh, we did not put here on this on the slide. It's the application that it was developed in, in, in Guinea Bissau that uh, uh, gives, uh, um, uh, for example, a patient uh, when when is aiming to travel, for example, has to go and go, uh, do a test, and this test is sent on SMS. Né? Uh, telling the the the, 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 the test I would say that uh, your, 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 your result is, is available. So it gives also a link that you can go and fit and what kind of action you should take. I think that is it's it's a very 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 important uh, application. But before that, it was uh, in terms of uh, concentration. On, I mean, uh, when the test started, it was free of charge in Guinea-Bissau, but now uh, 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 the people who are testing, they have to pay. I mean, and then uh, uh, new uh, uh, um, challenges have, have come up uh, that, for example, uh, some of data should be moved in different server. And here also we find a different problem in terms of uh, uh, capacity of these different servers. Uh, uh, when we put things in cloud, things work proper uh, uh, without any problem uh, with support of, uh, of Saudi or sometimes with different uh, uh, partners. But uh, uh, the country, they want their own physical uh, servers. And sometimes these servers, they don't have enough capacity to deal with this Kind of mega data that uh, are, are circulating within Tracker. I think this is uh, uh, the challenge that uh, we are facing, and probably with this uh, academy, probably we'll find some of the result. Thank you very much for listening to us. Great, thank you so much, Emilio. And that was, uh, I think, a perfect kind of setup for us to end the day on and leading into our first session tomorrow. So. Just a reminder to everybody, we will start again at the same time tomorrow using the same Zoom link, the same password to get in. And uh, some of those things that Emilio, you were just pointing out, and actually Otto, that you were as well about the key challenges and, and lessons learned, those are exactly the topics we're introducing uh, for the first session tomorrow, looking at the key considerations for tracker planning. 
Um, and then we'll spend the second session tomorrow looking into the readiness assessment and introducing the tool that we'll be using for planning for the rest of the week. So very uh, big thank you to all of the countries that shared in this uh, last session, their use cases. Uh, it really helps to see how Tracker is being used in action. Um, we hope all of you feel like you can uh, use the Slack and ask additional questions, and we are happy to try to follow up um, and appreciate your time today. We will do our best to stay on time uh, with the sessions, um, but of course, this is uh, something that we're still working on the format. But thank you for staying with us today, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. So thank you very much. <laughs>